All right, I asked you the question at the beginning of the service, when did you have a brush with greatness? And, you know, for me, my brush with greatness might be a little bit different than how you would define greatness. Um, I'm not really into sports, I've got to be honest with you. I, I want to be. I'm kind of a self-proclaimed Blackhawks and Cubs fan, but that's about the extent of it. I literally could not name for you five Cubs players right now. And in fact, let's be honest, I, I couldn't name one, okay? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sports fan the way some people are religious, okay? You know, Christmas and Easter, so I guess when the World Series is on or the playoffs, yeah, I'll watch. But um, not much of a sports fan. For me, greatness takes a little bit of a different definition. I'm really into apologetics, which is the defense of the Christian faith. I love philosophy. In fact, I'm studying philosophy in seminary right now. So for me, the, the guys that I would consider to be my heroes are these philosophers and these defenders of the faith, the ones that you can watch their debates on YouTube. There's this, this one um, apologist, someone who defends the faith. And this guy, I mean, I was into him, his work for a long time. I would read all of his books. Uh, I would literally go to sleep listening to his debates with my, my earbuds in, all right? So this is someone I really look up to, someone I would define as great. And I had an opportunity about two years ago to go and have pizza with, um, with this Christian apologist up in Milwaukee. It was me and a, a few other students from school. And so we, we went up there, we took a van up there, and we're all just kind of buzzing with excitement. The whole van ride up there, we're all trying to show that we... We, we know more about his arguments than anybody else, and we're kind of like, kind of trying to one-up each other. And we get up there, and we get to the top room of this pizza restaurant, and we're all sitting around waiting for about half an hour, waiting for him to come in, and just talking to each other and joking. But I'll tell you what, when, when this guy walked into the room, a hush fell over the room. All eyes were on him. All the conversation from that point onward was directed towards him. All the questions being asked were all directed towards him. And that was a moment, a brush with greatness that I will never forget. I still remember that, just seeing one of your heroes face to face. So cool. Maybe you've had a similar experience. Well, in, in today's text, we're going to look at someone who had a brush with greatness that makes my experience and your experience pale in comparison. It was a brush with greatness that radically redefined his entire life. And this is a really important text for us if we're Christians here this morning because, you know, as Christians, we understand that we are living for a higher purpose, right? We understand that we have a calling from God himself. We have this commission. In fact, we call it the Great Commission. Go out and make disciples from all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commands. There is no higher calling than that. So as Christians, we are on mission this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 But here's the challenge for us. Is even though we're on mission in our lives, and we understand that we are living out this, this battle, this war between good and evil, we have all these distractions in our lives. All these, these little molehills that seem like mountains in our lives that distract us from living out the Great Commission. How are we supposed to live out God's mission in our lives when we have co-workers who just antagonize us or when our kids start getting into all kinds of trouble? How do we live for Jesus in the midst of all these little things? Well, the big idea and what I think that God has for us today from this text is this. Every challenge that you face in your life is a little battle in the epic war between good and evil. We're going to unpack that idea this morning by looking at this story uh, from Joshua. All right, so now to answer this question of, of how do we see the little things in our life in the larger context, we need to ask three questions. And these three questions come right out of our text this morning. First, who is in control? Second, what is our role? And third, how do we win? Who's in control? What is our role? And how do we win? So let's 
dive right in. Let's look right at our text and look with me at verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him. This man that Joshua sees is going to completely radically redefine everything that Joshua knows and everything that Joshua is expecting from what's about to happen. So here's Joshua, and picture the scene with me. He has been commanded to go and take the city of Jericho. And he's gone off by himself. Israel is camped a few miles away, but Joshua is now by himself, We don't know exactly where he is, but he's probably up on a hill overlooking the city of Jericho. Now, the interesting thing is is this. It doesn't say that he had his eyes lifted up. He was scouting out the town. It says his eyes were down. And when your eyes are down, what are you most likely doing? Maybe you're praying. Maybe you're deeply contemplating. So here's Joshua, and the city is out before him, and his eyes are down like this. And you can see him just racking his brain. How are we going to take Jericho? We've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. And then he lifts up his eyes and imagine his surprise when he sees a man standing before him. So who is in control? First things first, Joshua sees a man. Now, What kind of man is this? Well, the man has his sword drawn. So picture a man standing in front of Joshua. Maybe it's twilight or or dimly lit. Joshua can't quite make out who he is, but he sees the glint of the sunlight off of this man's sword, and his sword is in his hand and drawn. Now, why does a soldier draw his sword? He's about to fight. So here's Joshua, and he sees this man, and he's taken aback, and the man has his sword out drawn. What's Joshua thinking at this point? Here's a soldier. Has he come to fight me? Is he here to do battle? There's a physical man in front of him. Joshua wasn't expecting anybody, but here he is with his sword drawn. Now this motif of a man popping up unexpectedly right before something important happens, this is a reoccurring theme in Scripture. Matter of fact, um, we see this really early on in Genesis with, uh, with Abraham. Abraham is kind of minding his own business and suddenly a man appears and and speaks to him face to face and has a message from God. We see this man pop up again when Jacob is on his way to reconcile with his brother Esau. In the middle of the night, a man shows up and Jacob wrestles with him till dawn. And now here's Joshua on the verge of his first great military siege and here's this same man popping up. Now, if you're reading through the Old Testament, you start to get the idea that this is the same man. You start to recognize him. He has similar characteristics. And it's funny. It makes me think of this movie that I saw a while ago called The Time Traveler's Wife. Anyone seen it? In The Time Traveler's Wife, it was based on a a book. It's really a fascinating story. But it follows the tale of this girl who grows into a woman. Her name is Claire. And... In Claire's life, this man keeps popping up at inopportune times, at significant points in her life. She eventually falls in love with him, and they get married, and that's where the title comes from, The Time Traveler's Wife. But this man keeps popping up in her life, and eventually she starts to recognize him and anticipate him, and they eventually fall in love. So for the student of the Old Testament here, who's reading through the the Pentateuch or the Torah, they would see this man constantly popping up, and they'd start to recognize him. Oh, There he is again. Something significant is about to happen. And this idea of a messenger from the Lord with his sword in his hand, that's a common motif too. We see that often in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, especially up to this point. Something significant is about to happen. So Joshua asks him a question. Look at verse 13. He says, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now Joshua is the captain of, the commander of Israel. He knows his soldiers, but he doesn't recognize this man. He doesn't recognize him from the the roll call, from the, the ranks, from the training, whatever they used to do in those days. So he's probably assuming this is a soldier from Jericho. You know, in those days, sometimes the way that wars were fought was one side would send out his best soldier, and the other side would send out their best soldier, and they would do hand to hand combat, and the winner would count, would be, would be a representative for the entire army. You know the story of David and Goliath? That's what's going on there. One soldier comes out and fights the other soldier from the other team. Maybe Joshua is thinking, 
that that's what's about to, to go down. So he's getting excited. He's like, all right, are you for us or for our adversaries? Is this about to go down? Is this how we're going to settle things? But we also get a clue to what Joshua might be expecting from Exodus 23. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 23. Keep your finger there in Joshua, but turn to Exodus 23. We're going to look starting in verse 20. There's an incredible promise that the Lord gives to Moses. Here's what he says. Verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Does that sound familiar? I right, turn with me back to Joshua. Look at the question that Joshua asks this man with his sword drawn. Are you for us or for our adversaries? So here's Joshua with a good knowledge of the first five books of the Old Testament because he heard them firsthand from Moses. And he knows about this promise that the Lord has given to Moses that, that God was going to send his angel. And Joshua is asking him, are you the angel that the Lord is going to send? He's testing him. Are you for us or for our adversaries? But like a good messenger of the Lord, what we might expect is the unexpected. The, this angelic messenger gives him an answer he doesn't expect. Instead of saying, yes, I'm with you, or no, I'm not, I'm actually with Jericho, he just says, no. I love that. Are you with us or with our enemies? No. <laughs> that wasn't an option. It's like on a multiple choice test. You write in, you know, you don't know the answer. Uh, D, none of the above. No, that's not an option. But why does he say that? What this man, this angelic messenger, is saying is he is superior to both sides. He says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. Now I have come. At this moment, I have arrived for a specific purpose. And it's not about you, Joshua, and it's not even about Israel. It's about the Lord. I am on the Lord's side. And that, that is already beginning to reorient how we think about our lives, isn't it? Is God for us or is God for our enemies? No. God is for God. We are on His side. That's how we have to think of it. Now, why does this messenger, this angelic messenger, come right at this point? Think about what's about to happen. Israel is about to go into the first battle that is, going to be, that is going to be like the domino effect as they go and they start to take over the promised land. And it's very important that the Lord establishes at this moment who is in control. And what he's saying, I am. Joshua has been going into this battle thinking that he's in control. He's gone off by himself to meditate and to contemplate his plan of attack. And the Lord meets him right where he is and says, no, Joshua, I'm in control. I'm in charge. Now, in what sense is he in control? He says, I am the commander. This angelic messenger says, I'm the commander of the armies of Yahweh, the hosts of Yahweh, the angelic hosts. What is he saying? He's saying he has authority over the spiritual realm. But then when we fast forward and we get into chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he says, I've given you Jericho. Jericho was a physical city. So here's a commander. Who is this? He's a commander of the spiritual realm, and he has authority to give something in the physical realm. Now, you can't give something you don't own, right? If I, Nathan, if I went to you and I said, I give you Jerry's car, you know, Jerry might have an issue with that. I don't own Jerry's car. I can't give it away. But here is this angelic commander saying, I'm giving you Jericho, Joshua. That means he has authority over the physical realm as well. All authority in heaven and on earth belong to this commander. Now, if you know your Gospels, that should sound familiar to you. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, who says that? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. 
Who says that? It's the Lord Jesus. Here is the appearance of the Lord Jesus in history, in physical form, long before he was ever incarnated as a man. Isn't that incredible? The theological term for this is a Christophany. It's an appearance, it's an epiphany of Christ. It's a revealing of Christ in the Old Testament. Now, what does this mean for Joshua and what does it mean for us? It means Joshua is not in control. Jesus is. The Lord is in control. What does this mean for you? You're not in control either. Joshua was the most important, most powerful man. Think about this. In the world at this time. How do we know? Israel was God's chosen people. Out of all the nations on earth, Israel was God's children. And Joshua was the leader of Israel. There's no one more important on earth than Joshua at this time. But he's not ultimately the commander. So what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? It means you're not in control. Now that, that's, that's good in two ways for us. One, because we don't have to come up with it on our own. We don't have to come up with our own plan for our own life. The Lord is in control. We, everybody can go ahead and breathe a big sigh of relief. We are not in control. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's not up to me to figure it out. I have a commander. But there's a responsibility with that. I have to repent of my desire to be in control of my life. I have to get out of the driver's seat and I would say let Jesus get in, but guess what, guys? He's already in the driver's seat, whether we acknowledge it or not. Notice the commander doesn't come down and go, if you choose, you can allow me to be the commander. No, he says, I am the commander of the hosts of Yahweh. Joshua understands the correct response. We're going to see what, what he does in a minute. My friends, every single day we need to get up with that realization that we are not in control. We need to ask ourselves that question when we get out of bed. In fact, before we get out of bed in the morning, who is in control of this day? And guess what? It's not you. Praise the Lord. Look at the victory that Christ has won for us. Why would we ever want to be in control? Turn with me really quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's look at verses... 25 and following. This is amazing. For he, that is Jesus, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. That means the Father. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Now skip ahead to verse 54. Last part of verse 54. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is your commander. Christian, we are not in control. Praise God. For Joshua, this would have exploded his mind, this realization that the Lord himself was joining them in battle. And this makes me think of Pittsburgh. Anybody ever been to Pittsburgh? Anybody ever driven through the Fort Pitt Tunnel if you've gone into to Pittsburgh? If you have, then you, you know what I'm about to talk about. Okay, when you drive into Pittsburgh... Uh, you go through these rolling hills, and it really feels like you're out in the middle of nowhere. And you come up ac across this small mountain. It's like a ridge. And you go into the, the Fort Pitt Tunnel, and you're just like, where am I? 
this, I feel like I'm in the middle of nowhere here, and this tunnel seems to stretch forever, and you're wondering, where is this city? My GPS is telling me I'm close, but where is this city? But then you come out of the tunnel, and the skyline explodes into your view. And it is beautiful. Pittsburgh is one of the most beautiful cities in the nation, I think. But it just explodes into your view, and it, it completely shocks you because you realize on the other side of this mountain is this, this whole city. It's this whole world you didn't even know was there. Well, that's what's going on with Joshua here. He thought he was alone. He was leading Israel into battle. He thought he had to figure it out himself. And the Lord himself appears to him and shows him this spiritual realm that he had no idea he was in the middle of. And it completely transforms his understanding of his role. So that brings us to the next question. What is our role? Let's look at verse 14. And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. What does Joshua do? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And Joshua understood his role pretty well, didn't he? As soon as he understood who was standing in front of him, he hit the deck. I'm not worthy, he seems to say. Now Joshua is the greatest hero Israel has at this point. And he is not worthy to even stand up before the Lord. Joshua begins to decrease here, and the Lord begins to increase. Isn't that exactly what John the Baptist says when he encounters Jesus? He says, he must increase, I must decrease. Joshua hits the ground, and he totally defers to the man with the plan. You know, I had an example of this on a much smaller scale this past weekend. I had the, the privilege of going up to Silver Birch Ranch in Wisconsin for our high school ministry's Winterfest. It was an awesome retreat, and one of the highlights of Winterfest is the broomball tournament. If you've never seen high schoolers playing broomball, you just haven't lived. It is intense. It is, it is a lot of fun. So the first day we were up there, our first game, I was our head coach. So I was the man with the plan, so to speak. Now, I don't know anything about broom ball. Okay, I've played before, but oh, I know how to slip around on the ice and swing a stick, I guess. But that's about all I know how to do. So I'm coming up with these different plays and things like that. Whatever. It was, it was fun. But the next day, my good friend Larry Dolendi joined us up at Winterfest. He actually drove five hours to meet us up there. And when Larry came up, I immediately knew who was going to be running the show, okay? Larry has played, so uh, has played hockey for years, and uh, he knows about strategy. He took one look at some of the things that I wanted to do, and he was like, no. I said, okay. I deferred to him, and he came up with some great strategies that totally helped. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was actually more fun having a better strategy. When the man with the plan shows up, you defer to him. That's what Joshua is doing. And how much greater is Joshua doing this than we might do to any human being? He hits the deck and he asks him, what do you command? If we're going to find out what our role is in God's great plan, we have to know the correct attitude to have before we can ask that question. We can't go to God while we're still sitting on the throne and go, all right, Lord, how are you going to help me with my plan today? No, if we're going to find out what the Lord has for us, we have to have the right attitude. We have to humbly submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, what do you command your servant? And the command that the Lord gives him at this point is amazing, isn't it? See, we expect him to start giving military advice. All right, here's how you're going to do it. Here's how you're going to build your siege works. You know, start building some battering rams, Joshua. Here's how we're going to get through those walls. That's not what he says. His first commandment? Take off your shoes. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Now that might strike you as odd because here's Joshua, he's on his face. He's not standing, okay? The Lord is telling him, take off your shoes. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Why does he say standing? Joshua's not standing up because this is an allusion to Exodus chapter 3. What happens in Exodus chapter 3? Moses is walking out by himself on the side of a mountain, tending to his sheep, and suddenly he sees a burning bush. And the I am, Yahweh, speaks to Moses from the burning bush. Moses is standing, and the Lord says, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Moses would have told this story to Joshua. Joshua knew that story well. 
So when the Lord appears to him and says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground, he is quoting himself from Exodus chapter 3. He's authenticating his identity to Joshua. If there was any doubt who is talking to Joshua at this point, all doubt is now gone. This is the Lord God Almighty, and what is about to come out of his mouth next is crucial, and he has to obey. Now, taking off his sandals seems like a small command. doesn't seem like a very big deal, right? Take off my sandals, okay? Joshua could have very easily said, ah, you know, let's get to the military advice here. Let's get to the really important commands, Lord. I've got an army to command here. I know you're the commander, but I still have to lead these people into battle. Can we get to the important stuff? But Joshua doesn't say that. He obeys. He understands that even the smallest command coming from the Lord is of vital importance. Let me ask you, is there a small command that you know is from the Lord, that the Lord wants you to do, that you have not yet submitted and obeyed? Are you a follower of Christ and haven't been baptized because you just haven't had time or you're worried what your family might think or, you know, it's just getting dunked in a bathtub. Who cares, right? It's a, it's a small deal. And yet the Lord commands us to be baptized. Is there a relationship that you need to reconcile? But you never see the person anymore, so it's not really in the front of your mind, and you've kind of let that slide, and maybe the weeks have turned into months or years, and there's still bad blood between the two of you. The Lord commands you to reconcile and to forgive. Maybe there's a besetting sin in your own life that you're just kind of living with. You don't think you can ever be free from it. You don't really want to be free from it. It's a small matter to you. And yet the Lord says, repent. See, we have to check our hearts because we have to ask ourselves, who is our commander? Joshua understood it. And if you are a Christian here this morning, then the Lord Jesus is your commander and we need to obey him. Joshua gets down and worships and the Lord says, worship me more. Humility is crucial before we can hear from the Lord. Now this makes me think of a... A movie that I saw recently actually was on the bus up to Winterfest, Remember the Titans. Anybody seen Remember the Titans? Such a great movie. So this African-American coach, if you haven't seen it, he moves into this, uh, this predominantly white town and he takes over the football, the football team at the local high school. And football is like a religion to these people. Um, and they're about to go to football camp and... Coach Boone is getting everybody on the bus and the quarterback, who's been the quarterback for a few years now, he comes and he starts barking orders to the coach. So if you've seen this, you know the scene that I'm talking about. And Coach Boone, he just, he asks Gary, the quarterback, he goes, Gary, where's your mama? Gary's taken aback and he looks and points, he goes, there's my mom. And he goes, wave goodbye to her. Because from now on, for the next two weeks, you don't have a mama anymore. All you have is your daddy. Who's your daddy, Gary? <laughs> and you just see Gary's face sink. He realizes what's happening here. This power struggle. And he eventually says, You are, sir? That's right, Gary. Get on the bus. Gary, the quarterback, had to learn humility before Coach Boone could ever lead him to victory. It's the same with Joshua. And it's the same with us. The Lord is not going to lead you to victory over the giants that he has laid out for you in your life until you understand who is in control and what is your role. How many plans do we make without the Lord and then ask him in retrospect to go back and kind of smooth things over for us? Lord, here I am. This is what I'm doing. Can you, can you make this work out for me? When in reality, if we would have checked with him in the, at the outset, maybe we wouldn't have done it. Maybe we would have gone that route, but we would have gone about it with a completely different mindset. Maybe you've seen that bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. No. God is not your co-pilot. God's the pilot. You ride in the, the car seat, man. <laughs> and here's why that is. God doesn't need us to accomplish his goals. The Lord doesn't need Joshua to defeat Jericho. It wasn't that long ago that he took out Sodom and Gomorrah. And he sure didn't use Abraham to do that, did he? 
He rained fire and brimstone down on the city. The Lord does not need us to accomplish his goals. So why does he use us? Because his goal is not just conquering Jericho. Although that, that is part of it. His goal is his relationship with his people. You know, one of the things I like to do at our house is to cook. And I'll leave it up to Elisa to vouch for how good I am at it, but I do enjoy it. And in the morning, sometimes I'll make oatmeal for the family, and I like to doctor it up, put all kinds of stuff in there. And I can whip up some oatmeal pretty quick. But one of Jacob, my son's favorite things to do, is to help Daddy make the oatmeal. And so he comes up on his step stool, and he pours the oats, and he pours water, and he's spilling it everywhere. And it is just the cutest thing to see. And it takes much longer, and it's much messier. But you know something? It's quality father and son bonding time. It's so much fun to do this with my son. See, the Lord doesn't need us any more. In fact, he needs us way less than I need anyone's help making oatmeal. But the goal is bonding with his children. It's the relationship. So how do we win this battle? Look with me now at chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. How do we win? For Joshua, Jericho was not the end game. It was just the first battle of many in taking over Canaan. So for Joshua, the larger context was the whole land of Canaan, also known as the promised land. Jericho was the first stop in the battle, but he had to view Jericho in context. So he has to face Jericho knowing that if he wins, and when he wins, he has more cities to conquer, more cities to take. But God brings him to Jericho first because Jericho was quite, quite possibly the most invincible walled city in Canaan at that time. Which is totally ironic because 40 years prior to this, uh, the previous generation had entered into the promised land, or they, they, they sent spies into the promised land through the south. So if, um, if uh, the promised land is, is a long sliver of land like this, they had entered into the south, and that's where they saw the giants. Remember that? They went in, and the two spies said, there's giants in the land, we'll never take it. So the Lord brings them. They're not lost for 40 years, but he, he winds them through the desert and brings them now. They're coming in through the northwest. And in the northwest, there's no giants, but there is the most impregnable, invincible city that they are that they are going to face. Why does the Lord bring them there? Because if they can take Jericho, they can take any of the other cities. He's trying to show them who's really in control, and he's trying to give them an early victory in the larger context of, of the war. So they have to understand that the, the battle of Jericho is in the larger context of the war on Canaan. The war between good and evil. And make no mistake, it is a war between good and evil. These people were utterly, utterly depraved and sinful. The, the wretched things that they were doing. The horrible, blasphemous things that they were doing merited them this destruction. But they must face Jericho. So what does this mean for us? We have to understand the battles in our own life in the larger context. The smaller struggles that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, the goal of mending that relationship with that person, the goal of obeying the Lord in those little things, it's not those, it's not those little things that's the main goal. The main goal is your relationship with your Creator. So we have to understand the smaller battles in the context of the larger war. We have to understand that the goal is the relationship with God, and we have to recognize who our commander is, the Lord Jesus Christ. And where do we get our commands from Jesus? Right here. There's no other place that the Lord speaks to us with authority, with sufficiency, than right here in Scripture. Are you listening to your commander? Are you spending time with him? Would you recognize his voice? If I was up here telling you something that was, not, that was not from the Bible, would you recognize it? Jesus said, the sheep hear my voice. Do you know your master's voice? Do you know your shepherd's voice? Do you know your commander's voice? You know, we have promises that are 
much more incredible than Joshua, don't we? You know, Joshua was promised a physical victory. He was promised God's presence for that battle. But how much greater is our situation than Joshua's? We, we don't just have the Lord even walking next to us. We actually have the Lord inside of us. The Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. That is unbelievable. That is an amazing truth. What does that mean? That means that when we're listening to his voice, when we're following him and we're desiring to be obedient to him, everything in our life becomes redefined. Now, if you're, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you're not a believer, you're, you haven't repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, here's why this matters to you. Right now you're sitting on the throne of your own life. You're trying to command your own life. I don't know how it's going for you. Maybe you'd say it's going pretty well. But when we zoom out, what this passage shows us is we need to submit. If you're here today and you have not gotten off the throne of your own life and acknowledged who the Lord is and who the commander is, I urge you, be reconciled to your Creator. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins to reconcile you with God so you wouldn't have to try and figure it out on your own. You wouldn't have to try and piece together a a hodgepodge philosophy to get you through life. I urge you to be reconciled to God. And if you are a Christian here this morning, my friends, this is the best news in the world. We have a commander who has given us his instruction in his word, like a good commander, but he's also with us in the battle, beside us, with us in truth, by his Holy Spirit, with us in the church, in our community, and he has also gone out ahead of us. Now, what are our marching orders as Christians? The two greatest commands of the Lord, love the Lord your God. Say it with me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's your marching orders. When we approach our lives with those two great commands and the great commission to go out and make disciples, at the forefront of our mind, it changes everything. So suddenly those co-workers that are just aggravating you, driving you crazy, that's an opportunity to love God by loving your neighbor. That's an opportunity to make a disciple. That's an opportunity to give an answer for the hope that you have. And my friends, let me tell you, Jesus Christ has already gone ahead of you. And here's what he's promised. He has promised you tribulation, suffering, pain. Didn't think I was going to say that, did you? He has promised us hardship, but meaning. Challenge with certain victory. Pain with the promise of unending, unbelievable bliss at the end of the tunnel. Meaning that transcends everything else we could possibly live for. When we live with that kind of hope, that's the thing that gets people's attention. View your life in the context of the greater battle between good and evil knowing that you have certain victory, knowing that Jesus has already faced that pain, faced that death ahead of you, and has conquered it, has won the battle, and it changes everything.